I'm good. All right, so um, we, I did a workshop about two hours ago. Uh, it was a four-hour workshop. Um, we talked a lot about rail security, uh, condensed a two-day course into four hours. So this talk is going to have some overlap for those of you that were at the workshop. Uh, but the primary focus tonight is uh, Rails Go, because I'd love to see some additional contributors. It's an open source project, so easy to get started. Should grab some water real quick. So uh, I'm the chief uh, tired all the time officer at Invisium, or CTO. Uh, I used to work at Living Social, and I always like to clarify uh, that that was before the hack. Um, don't look at me for that. Uh, I develop heavily in Rails, and I'm a security engineer at the same time, so um, it's kind of like a weird mix of skill sets. Hopefully that uh, translates to some, some interesting things I can show you. Uh, I'm a co-author of Rails Goat. Mike McCabe could not be here, and uh, so that means I get to say about him whatever I want. He, he did work at Living Social with me. We left in 2013 to partner up with Jack. Um, and uh, basically, you know, he's paler than me, not as smart or good looking as me. Uh, he loves skakis, so those are skinny jeans, but khakis. <laughs> Just say whatever I want, basically, at this point. <laughs> really not here. To so so uh, why start it? Uh, there really wasn't, I mean, you have your Rails cheat sheets, but beyond that, not a whole lot of quality material out there. A lot of it's geared towards, you know, some default configuration type stuff. Uh, so, if, you know, it makes sense to take lessons learned from picking apart applications all the time um, and take those examples and put them into, a, you know, an open source training platform that's engaging. Um, and really, it's to help all of you. So, hopefully some folks, has, who's, has anyone downloaded it or even taken a look or heard of it? Nobody? A couple of people? All right. Cool. It's good, good I'm here, I guess. So uh, basic configuration right now, when we talk about Rails Goat, is it's a 3x app. Uh, it's got some custom authentication. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, MySQL is an option, but by default, it's SQLite. Uh, uses the mail catcher, standard things you'd expect to see. Uh, RSpec tests, now these tests are a little bit interesting, and I think if we have time, I can demo them. Uh, the tests are actually security tests, so they're RSpec tests. Uh, there's twofold ones so that we know that obviously the uh, application is still working as expected. But the security side of it is that, and from a training perspective, is that if there, uh, you know, if you haven't fixed the flaws by default, there's something like 21 failed tests. So as you fixed each individual, uh, you know, vulnerability, you run the tests and shows you kind of like, hey, you know, you're good to go. Um, and. Uh, in the future, what Al's actually helping out with right now is we're upgrading to Rails 4 to address specific security concerns in Rails 4. Um, and, you know, who's using Devise? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, that's about what I thought. So the custom authentication thing, it was relevant at the time, I thought, but it turns out a lot of you folks are using Devise, so uh, it makes more sense to show insecure uh, configurations rather than... Um, uh, or how to configure it securely, rather, uh, than talking about custom auth. MySQL will be default, SQLite will be optional, uh, and also very open to suggestions. So this was built to be something that could be extended, so hopefully you folks can help out there. So I'm kind of going to just walk right into it. I'm going to jump right into, uh, as I explained earlier today, uh, the way I'm breaking this out is model layer, presentation layer, and logic layer. Uh, my reasoning behind that is I kind of like to force the idea that the logic should be in the controller um, and that the presentation layer has very uh, specific things that can go wrong with it. So talk about that. So mass assignment, Rails 4. Uh, I think, who, who prefers the, the strong parameters over the uh, adder accessibles in the model? Okay, yeah, I figured as much. People really like it. It's good, it, it, you know, it's good, but keep in mind that if you ever take data from anywhere else other than the controller, you're vulnerable, right? Unless you take some precautions, uh, if you're importing from some file or some other location other than the controller, you're still vulnerable to mass assignment. Um, who here has seen mass assignment exploited? Well, other than the, the Iron Yard folks, and yeah, speaking of which, great group, awesome. 
There you go. Uh, Rails 2 and 3, um, I'm sure some of you are running 2. Don't feel bad. It's, it's fine. It happens. A lot of people are still running 2. Uh, Rails 2 and 3, obviously, it's a pretty significant problem. Um, and, uh, you know, we want you to be able to audit your application. So I'll just show you real quick what mass assignment looks like when you go to exploit it. So we're going to go ahead and sign up uh, for a user. We'll show the exploit and then, you know, just briefly delve into the code. You can take a look. I mean, I'm hoping most of you are familiar with what I'm talking about, but we'll see. All right, so we've got uh, a few parameters we'll put in here. We'll sign up for this user. And, uh, all right, so I'm just signing up for an account. Obviously, I shouldn't be an administrator of this application. But my goal is to, to be an administrator of the application. So I'm going to go ahead and submit this. I'm going to catch it in the proxy. So my proxy, if you're not familiar with this, is a local intercepting proxy. It means that I can catch all of my data before it ever reaches the web application, modify it, automate some things, uh, like brute forcing passwords or username and passwords. There's a whole plethora of things I can do. This tool's pretty awesome. Uh, we didn't make it. It's just some popular security tool. And uh, so basically, um, what I've done here is I've sent off the request to the application, I've proxied it, and I want to modify it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just take one of these parameters, copy it, add a new one. I'm going to add this admin true, and then go on through. And so on the left-hand side, what you see is I have administrator access, uh, accessibility. Uh, main reason for that is that if you actually look at the code, it's very simple. I mean, I'm sure some of you have seen this. So it's pretty, it's pretty simple. I'll blow it up real well for you in the back. Uh, maybe a little bit more. How's that? OK back there? Yeah. OK. So we uh, instantiate a uh, new user model object, and we use all of the params that a user has provided us. Uh, this is pretty common. It's a pretty typical way to do it. Mass assignment in and of itself is not a vulnerability. It is a, a function. We talked about that, Frank. We, we discussed that earlier today. Uh, so it's not in and of itself a vulnerability, but obviously when you get to the model layer and you allow attributes such as you know, admin, role type, role ID, those type of things, um, and you instantiate a model with everything that I provide you, from the attacker standpoint, I now control what kind, of, what kind of user I actually create, what kind of user you create as an application. So that's mass assignment in a nutshell. Other forms uh, should be in here. There's lots of vulnerable, vulnerable code in here. Uh, so just want to want you to be aware that uh, update attributes, plural, um, when you take parameters from a user and you update attributes, it's also going to follow the same type of rules that instantiating a new object would. Uh, so also a place that you might be um, vulnerable to mass assignment. Any questions so far? Okay. All right. All right. So that's mass assignment. Talk about a few other things here. All right, so hashing versus encryption. Hashing, one way, not meant to be read again, right? Encryption is. Encryption is meant to be uh, secret, but reversible so that you can retrieve that data. Hashing is a good use case when you're talking about passwords, uh, is depending on how your application is architected and your use case for credit card numbers or socials. Maybe it makes sense. Maybe encryption makes sense. But uh, hashing and encryption are two very different things, right? Uh, is MD5 a strong hashing algorithm, out of curiosity? <laughs> All right. I'm so going to go with the opposite. Say yes. Yes. For the right, for the right purposes. Yeah. Uh, hmm. For what kind of purposes? Well, I mean, it's a perfectly valid hashing algorithm. Um, collisions are still, still not, you're not able to reproduce them at whim. However, it's very fast, and, they're, and it's just past its prime. I mean, we have other algorithms to use for that same purpose. But MB5 itself is not fundamentally broken, but it is not a good password hashing algorithm either. Yeah. It's easy to crack. If you're, if you you're calculate them really fast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
rainbow tables, anybody have any familiarity with that? So it's pre-computed hashes, taking large lists of passwords, hashing them, and then checking whatever database you stole against that list. Um, so in terms of strong hashing and strong encryption, for hashing, you know, you can use bcrypt. That's pretty solid. Um, some of the things I've talked about earlier today were SHA-512, SHA pretty decent. Uh, when we talk about encryption algorithms, AES-256 uh, is all right, 512 is fine. Um, what would uh, not be preferred would be something like, uh, I don't know, Frank, you think of something. What's an older, anything CBC based? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> don't admit your own. Yeah, I don't do that know. either. Uh, please don't, yeah. yeah. Yeah, don't roll your own in crypto. I mean, I'm sure there's some very smart people in this room, but uh, the community is smarter, in my opinion. You know, more people looking at that code. Um, and then, real briefly, I want to touch on uh, Rack Utils Secure Compare. Is there anybody besides the people that were in the course earlier today? Is there anybody that knows about this particular uh, utility? Okay, so I'm gonna show you guys something real quick. I'm gonna show you a vulnerable version of authentication along with a, uh, uh, the secure fix for that. Uh, Secure-ish, this is still a vulnerable application, so. Okay, so this is a, a vulnerable uh, version. So I don't know if you guys, there's two ty different type, type of timing attacks. Uh, the, the secure compare kind of leads us into that discussion. Uh, for timing attacks, um, if you, for instance, this is something I talked about earlier, if you find a user, like let's say you're given a username and pass, or email and password, and so you have to look up in the database if that user's email exists, and then you perform some actions. It could be something that's real short, like the little block of code you see here, or it could be something that's a, a lot more extensive. Um, and in those cases, when it's a bit more going on under the hood, there is a milliseconds difference, and the tool I was using, by the way, actually allows me to see millisecond type. I can actually calculate differences in responses. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you say, oh, I didn't find your email, just go away, I'm not gonna do anything else, then that means that there's just not code that's being executed and I can start to enumerate based off of time differences if a user exists or if they don't. That's the first part of it. Um, and then the second part is doing a password comparison. So when you use the two equal operator, uh, it's really not a secure form of performing password comparisons specifically. And the reason is, is that something like secure compare ensures this, it takes the same amount of time to calculate uh, a password that doesn't exist or a password that you know the, the each character doesn't match up. It, it makes sure that it's a, a, there's no variable length that's always gonna take the same amount of time to respond. Again, the reason for that, and I explain this at a high level, and that's pretty much where I'll go with it, is that imagine you're doing a comparison and the first character of your password is, uh, that you've provided to the application is B, and the password for that actual user is A. Well, there's gonna be a little bit of a time difference there, right? As you're performing this, this, this uh, response, or I'm sorry, this request, and as A, you know, if A, you've provided A and the, the first character of the password is A, uh, then you start to see a little bit of a difference there between how the application behaves if the first character is, you know, whatever, like, if they match up or if they don't. That's the general gist, right? Um, and then if you do that per character eventually, the theory is anyways that you, uh, you can pa uh, crack passwords. So, quick question, uh, anybody familiar with Code of Hell? Really? They, uh, developed Bcrypt? Jim? Okay, well, anyways, uh, really harping on, uh, uh, using secure compare right now. Uh, the gem didn't used to, but uh, I think also there's some practical attacks shown, uh, so, but I don't have the link for it um, that he's put out. So I would definitely look into it. So the fix for this, trying to be pretty quick here. Um, no, <laughs> that's a no, don't do that. Um, but yeah, so the fix here is that, you know, if the user's not found, then we'll just create them. Right, we'll create a user with a blank password. It's completely fine. Because the password that, and their, their password's blank, but the password that you provided the application in this next line actually gets, uh, granted it's a terrible hashing alg algorithm, but it still gets hashed. So nothing still becomes something, right? An empty string still becomes something. And so when you perform a comparison, the user password, unless the user's password, unless it's completely empty, uh, they're not gonna match up, right? So that's 
an easy way to, to kind of um, make sure that even if the user doesn't exist, you still execute some code. And then the second part of that is using the dot secure compare so that the password comparisons are always the same length. So uh, just an easy thing you can do. Do you know what Rack originally used the secure compare for? And why, do they, why is it part of their utilities? Oh, it's actually used quite a, in quite a few places, and it's not just in that gym. I, I, for some reason, it's reused in other gyms that support Rails, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I don't know, actually. Um, yeah, there's a specific use case. Um, actually, I shouldn't have gone into PowerPoint, because I want to show you something real quick. Uh, something to think about, and something that's a little bit, a little bit fun. And it comes out of Rails Go. It's a tutorial in there. Um, so real quickly, I showed this earlier today. It was, I think it was a little fun. Um, so. We have an application that has two different features that we're going to talk about. One is your account. Okay, so um, you can, for direct, de direct deposit purposes, put in your bank account number, your routing number, whatever percent, and um, then I'll show you that the, the data that comes back in terms of your bank account number is uh, it's encrypted, right? Okay, cool. Nothing out of the ordinary with that at all. So we'll go ahead and log out. And go to go ahead and click this remember me, remember me function. And uh, actually. All right, so I've got my little raw post request, and I've got a little response here, and I've got this auth token. So it's not the Rails Goat session, it's an auth token, it's a remember me cookie. So what I'm gonna do here is just real quickly normalize this. I'm gonna decode this value. Yeah. Starting to look a little similar to something else we just saw. So, and then the uh, last thing I'll do is I'll just send that over to compare. All right, so we'll uh, go ahead and let that request on, or sorry, that response on through, and then go back to the pay and I wanna try something. So at this point as an attacker, I've realized, I remember me cookie looks a little strange, a little similar to this. All right, so let's try some things. So I can see right here, this is my user ID, RESTful route, uh, put in a bank account number. Again, arbitrary data. And uh, I'll take this value and compare it to the uh, bank account number. And we can see they're exactly the same, right? They're, they're exactly the same, there's no differences. Cool. Anybody have a guess where I'm going with this besides the people that attended earlier? All right. Put a whole bunch of bank account numbers in and see if they compare out the same. It's, uh, it's shifting the mindset a little bit to what an attacker does, which is use some creative method of, yeah, similar kind of uh, concept, but um, just shifting the mindset a little bit towards what could I do. That's really what we spend our lives doing, is what could we do. So um, if user ID five, and that value that it's produced is my remember me cookie, means that they're encrypting my user ID using the same routine used to encrypt my bank account number. So maybe I'll just try user ID one. What's user ID one? Typically, anybody. Yeah, higher privileged account. So we'll we'll go ahead and submit that, <coughs> and then take that value. We'll modify our cookie. I'm just URL encoding in case you guys are, I mean, I think probably everybody's familiar with that, but I'm just URL encoding special characters, plus sign, equal sign. You kind of have to, it's an RFC. And uh, I'll hit refresh. <laughs> Oops, that didn't work. Oh, actually it did, sorry. Uh, yeah, so 
Oh, maybe it did. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. Something uh, different. Uh, something's different. But uh, <laughs> live demos, right? That's why I usually make videos. So. Um, so capital B in the encoding. <laughs> yeah, we'll get that shot. Some of some of us from the lab went in and made it secure. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, maybe it's lowercase. Could be. Can you the value in the tool? Yeah, actually, I could do that. I could use the tool. All right, well, I'm walking away from this for a second because it's clearly not going to work, so I want to move on past it. Uh, typically, what happens, what happened earlier was that uh, the user ID 1 was converted into a remember me cookie, and then you know, I logged in. Once I hit refresh, I was actually an admin. So uh, I'll come back to that and figure out why that's broken. Something must have changed. Um, all right, so moving forward, and then I, again, I'll go back to that at the end if I still have time. Um, so the active record uh, library. So we, we had this uh, decent conversation on this. My opinion is that it's safe if used correctly, or mostly safe, I should say. And the reason is there are certain, uh, if, you, if you have your laptop up or later, please check out rails-sqli. Org. So it's got this whole list of methods. I'll pull it up real quick. Uh, basically, dangerous uh, methods in. So these are all dangerous methods uh, within Active Record, and it's very hard to see. I know, but go visit the site. Um, there, are, there are some things in here that might surprise you, and the one that surprises me the most is Pluck. Uh, if you're not familiar with Pluck, Pluck is an active record method to only retrieve a certain column or columns of data from the database, right? Straightforward. So it should really only need like a string column name. Uh, unfortunately, you can put raw SQL into it. So yeah. if well, you do this. It's a fairly recommended practice to, to limit what comes back from a select. And a lot of times when using, I mean, yeah, and user input gets passed into it. And at that point, any of the user input, if this is params column, that's immediately like I could just pass you SQL data and immediately execute SQL queries on your site. And that's why I say there are a ton of methods on this list that it shows either that they're unsafe or how they could be used unsafely. So I'd say go ahead and take a look at this. Um, I will, I, I'm not going to go on the demo spree right now. Uh, that might take a, take a while. Um, presentation layer. All right, so um, XSS, cross-site scripting, seemingly boring topic normally. A uh, couple things I want to hit on before I actually show you what the real danger of cross-site scripting is. I think that was a, a fun moment yes, uh, this, today for everyone. So, All right, so... Uh, Couple things before I go into this. Uh, HTML safe, that is the worst method you could have, anyone could have ever named that method. It's not safe. It's the exact opposite of safe, right? If you use HTML safe, any protection you had from Rails is completely gone. All it is is a wrapper for safe buffer, which is simply for strings. And it's nothing, it's nothing to do with like actually escaping or HTML encoding uh, data. So it's uh, more of a declaration. You're, yeah. you're saying that it's saying it's HTML. Yeah, uh, which is, yeah, I mean, there's, I could see that, but it's, yeah, it's confusing for sure, yeah. Um, so are you guys, anyone familiar with the, uh, the JSON issue in three, at least 3.2 Rails? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I should be more specific. <laughs> Oops. Just when you load anything from people, yeah. 
So um, basically, this just doesn't work. It's comp the, the point of this particular uh, the point of this particular method is to take JSON when it's formatted, you know, dot you know, whatever you call it, dot JSON, then respond with JSON. The idea was uh, inherently you're protected because as soon as you boot up an app, the configuration um, sets that to true, which is uh, which is typically great, except for in 3.2, it totally doesn't work and nobody wants to do anything about it. And so we're kind of just stuck with a little workaround. Um, I can't remember, uh, you know, I, can't, I cannot remember it right now off the top of my head, but it's in uh, Rails Goat, something similar to uh, uh, something like this, um, and then that will actually enact uh, the protection. But again, if you're using a 3.2x app, go back and make sure you're actually doing this correctly, because otherwise, when you go to parse with jQuery, or if you got a mobile app that uses WebKit or whatever, you're, you know, there's if there's a web engine underneath the whatever is parsing that response could could end badly. So, all right. Now for the uh, fun part. All right, so let's hope this demo goes better. All right. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and fire up this server. It's called uh, Beef, and Beef is the uh, browser exploitation framework. So somebody decided that um, XSS is pretty dangerous, it can be. So I'm gonna build an entire open source tool around uh, exploiting cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. What's the normal, I mean, the normal thing that you see when you get a, if you were to get a report from a security person or you know, kind of take a look at cross-site scripting, you see something like So that's what you might see in your like audit or you know if you're reading up on the tutorials like a little JavaScript alert box. Okay, um, not very fun, um, not very interesting. But there is, like I said, something dedicated to actually making it fun and interesting. So with Beef, the way I'm going to separate this is Safari is going to be the attacker, uh, Safari browser is going to be the attacker, and the Firefox browser is going to be the victim. So. Uh, All right, so now got to be a little bit creative here and think, and, and this is something I talked about as well. So uh, yeah, this is a cross-site scripting vulnerability in my profile, right? I'm sure the first thing you think of is why does it matter if you can cross-site cross -site script your XSS yourself? Uh, it matters because if there's additional vulnerabilities like insecure direct object reference, which would allow you to overwrite somebody else's profile uh, profile details, if at any point anything else get in, gets introduced, this becomes a, a major problem. Uh, so it is important even if you can only cross-site script yourself. Um, definitely something to take a look at. So I'm going to grab a demo page here, and just to be clear, that demo page is, um, it's, it's silly, because it's obvious that you're being cross-site scripted. In reality, you'll never see this coming, I promise. You visit a vulnerable site, you'll never know this is happening. Or if you create a vulnerable site. So I'm just going to say that the, uh, you know, the document.location, this is, this, this is the address of this demo page. So basically, when I go ahead and submit this and I hit refresh, um, you know, I'm redirected. The actual attack for this, by the way, the actual uh, really useful attack is doing a script source and including the beef JavaScript that they actually have. And it's kind of cool because, well, you never know it's happening as a victim. And as an attacker, you just keep this persistent connection to your, your victim. So it's, it's really nice for, <laughs> for me. <laughs> so um, commands. 
there are a ton of things that are available, a ton of options for this tool. Um, Metasploit, if you're not familiar with it, it is the large, I believe right now it's the largest Ruby project in existence and its sole purpose is to exploit everything electronic, right? Embedded devices, machines, browsers, all that. So what Beef did and what Metasploit did is they thought, you know, let's team up. So what's nice about Beef is that, and you'll see, that, uh, you may not be able to see it actually, there is a uh, um, Metasploit hook so basically, once your victim's in here, you can just start throwing, like you can detect what kind of browser you're using, what kind of system you're using, find out if it's vulnerable, and then start throwing shell code at them and get a reverse shell and have complete control of their system. So that's the sort of the beginning. Um, and you know, just kind of funny stuff. I mean, we can say like, you know, we can just send some code just to verify that it's actually working. And we, what we did is, as, a, as a, an attacker, we just sent some code to the victim's browser. So this is the, the sort of uh, beginning of what you, you know, just kind of this is a silly idea. What I want you to know, though, is that the, the more common use cases for this is still in, if you autocomplete your yeah, username, password, and all that, uh, theft of that through, this, uh, through beef, um, caching. So if you've ever looked at your uh, Firefox cache, you have both requests and responses uh, cached. So um, unless somebody said specifically with caching headers, you know, hey, don't cache this page, it's sensitive. So this tool automates the process of pilfering through the browser. So it's, it's fairly serious. Um, and I'll show you a video real quick of the fun part of this, the entertaining part anyways. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, wrong one. Okay, so right now we uh, in this video, oh, we have the uh, the client actually locked in, like you saw mine. Um, I'm doing this because it's like a, it's actually pretty tedious to do some of this stuff. It's beef is the one shortcoming. Uh, what I have to do is basically what I'm trying to do here. What I'm going to try to accomplish is steal your webcam. I want to like uh, basically turn off the light on your camera so you don't know I'm doing it and just steal pictures of you all day long. So this is what I'm doing. Let's start. Basically, the webcam has a few options. How many pictures you want to take? What's the social engineering gimmick that you want to send at them? Uh, this one says, in order to work with the programming framework this website is using, you need to allow <laughs> Adobe Flash. Click yes. How many users are not going to click yes at this message? And then we've got a description. We've got this social engineering title, so you can change that around and modify it. Uh, interval of which to take pictures. In this video, I changed it to three seconds, because one second is just its too much data all at once. So. Go ahead and execute that. Now, uh, what happens is, um, and this is the tedious part. Oh, by the way, I just allowed it, so cool. I'm going to start collecting pictures here. And this is the tedious part. Basically, all this data comes in and it's uh, stored as JSON, and it is base64 encoded. So I'm basically going through the database. Uh, this is actually the way you have to do it. It kind of slacking. Um, you copy one of the images, parse out any of the JSON stuff. Um, you know, uh, brackets and uh, quotation marks. Then take that file you just created, base64 to code, and output it to a uh, .png, .jpg, something like that. And then open it. Yes. So that's <laughs> that's me taking a little picture of myself with a whiteboard, but. Um, Hopefully, some of this gives you some impact around, around cross-site scripting. I really harp on that just because uh, it's, it's, it doesn't get necessarily the respect it deserves as a vulnerability. Any questions so far? So are you saying that out of the box, if I were to start a new Rails 3.2 app, that the, if I had, and I had a user field, if I put some script in the first name, that it would not be protected? Like, I thought Rails out of the box would protect that. Rail out of the box does. So let me like separate the concept. So basically, Rails uh, not two. Rails two is not. It's vulnerable. Uh, it does not do any escaping automatically. Rails three does, and that's fine. Rails four does. 
the problem that the shortcoming with 3.2 is only in the JSON format. Like normally, if you want to actually protect your JSON data, or if you want to take that, because if you've ever actually looked at cross-site scripting, it's, it's it, what it is is basically the, um, let me see if I can't kill my cookies here. It's basically just your input being interpreted as, uh, yeah, as code. That's a simple concept. So um, the difference being that how you protect JSON and how you protect everything else is really different because uh, HTML, in, 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 when you protect it, it's H, you're basically HTML encoding all of the gra greater than, less than, any potential uh, characters that could be interpreted as code. Whereas with JSON, all of those special characters are actually Unicode encoded. So, Unfortunately, again, like the issue is, is that JSON itself, not like the HTML responses, um, that's definitely vulnerable out of the box with 3.2x. So you should definitely go back and look if that's if that's a concern. Well, probably should be. So um, otherwise, I'm just gonna keep getting redirected. All right, cool. All right, so um, just to show you real quick what that looks like. All right, so um, All right, so what I, my input, basically, you can see that uh, in its natural form, it has the um, script tags, and Firefox highlights it and all that because it, it is code, right? So it, it makes sense that it would interpret it. It's not safe. It wasn't outputted safely, but um, it is code nonetheless. So here's what it looks like natively without using the HTML safe method. And this is, this is sort of like what, and also you'll notice like before welcome comma nothing. And that's because there was no text there. It was just JavaScript. Here it actually shows it. So the idea behind HTML encoding is just to show that as, um, as text versus being interpreted as code. And you can see that here. The browser no longer looks at it as code. It looks at it as uh, you know, text. So it's not interpreted maliciously. It's pretty nice. Um, let's see here, might have to skip over. Uh, real quickly, uh, client side versus server side cookies. Client side means all of the important data is stored within the cookie itself, and there is a hash along with it to protect the cookie. Server side, uh, all you see is, and I actually had brought this up earlier. Um, let's see here. So here's what uh, a server-side cookie looks like. Basically, the cookie is going to have this uh, session identifier value. If uh, it's hard to see, but it's a sort of like it looks a pretty much fixed length value, and it's short. Whereas the um, the data that that goes with it is actually this data over here is this bah7, and then this long string. This is actually what a client-side cookie normally looks like. But when you switch from basically here in the session store. You can go with the cookie store, which is the client side cookies, or you can go with the active record store, and that is the database storage. Um, when you go with the database storage or server side cookie, that's the setup I just showed you in SQL Pro. Uh, but when you go with the normal um, client, uh, the client side is as default. And this is, by the way, um, should mention that three. That 3x, uh, 2x, 3x um, behave differently than Rails 4. By default, Rails 4 cookies are encrypted, and they also don't use Marshall to um, read the data. They actually use JSON, which is much, much safer if you're familiar at all with Marshall serialization of, of objects, um, and basically taking a string and making it code. Uh, so this is pretty much what a, uh, a cookie really consists of when it's default client side. Um, when it's a default client side cookie. So. There's a few things we have to do. One, we have to URL, uh, URL decode the cookie to normalize it. OK. 
Okay, so we've normalized it. The next thing we're going to do is just simply uh, base64 and marshal load it. All right, so what you can see here is the, uh, the true value of what that client side cookie looks like. And remember, if it's Rails 2, Rails 3, this is, uh, you know, anybody can see whatever you put in there. So, yeah, I mean, be cautious of what you put in there from a, you know, if you're putting in some sensitive data, you definitely don't want to do that. Um, however, the, does anybody know why this is tamper proof? Like, even if I marshal dump it and base 64 encode it, does anybody have any idea uh, why this would be um, tamper proof? Sorry, who was that? That was me. Oh, it was HMAC. HMAC. Yes, I'm my name is Jeff. So it's encrypted and signed. So if you tamper with it, it's going to come back as a nil. It won't be, you won't even get it back from the library. Yep. Yeah, so there's two parts to these cookies. Um, the first part's the, the actual data. Um, the second part is your hash, and there, you know, got the two hyphens there. Um, so this hash, basically, the app takes this data. It takes um, the secret token, stored in your secret token. Well, sorry, no, uh, don't store it in your secret token .rb file unless you're in development, and I mean specifically this. Don't put in your source code at all. It's not a good idea. Terrible idea. Uh, use something else. Um, what I think is a decent solution is uh, like, you know, if you're using something like AWS, allows you to, Elastic Beanstalk allows you to put environment variables in through the UI. Uh, what might make more sense is stick with this for development. Like if, um, you know, rails.env.development question mark, that's fine. Everything else, go with the environment variable. And that way you're not actually storing that uh, token in your source code. Because there's like the, the best outcome if somebody steals this is they just take. Uh, using uh, oops, using message verifier, um, they just create this uh, this cookie and rotate one of the values, and then the uh, two parts of this match up, right? Because basically the app takes this value, takes a secret token, mashes them up, and it creates this value. And if the if this uh, being hashed and and using that secret token doesn't match up to this, like Frank said. It's, it's it's a no go. But if you have uh, the secret token in your possession, because there's like file access issues where you know you just said, oh, okay, whatever uh, you give me, I'm going to go ahead and render that file to you. And instead of choosing whatever dot PDF, they chose you know dot dot forward slash config initialize or secret token dot RV. So if they steal this secret token, the best case scenario is they change the user ID and then they uh, forge a new cookie. That's the best case. The worst case scenario, if you're using Rails 2 or 3, is that, again, that Metasploit framework has automated the process of giving a secret token and then completely getting shell on the machine. The reason is, is that once you're able to forge that cookie, because it's Marshall uh, serialized, when it reaches the application, whatever you've put in here gets converted to code. and um, so if it's valid and the application accepts it, you're executing code on the system. So again, Metasploit automated that entire process so that you can just click a few buttons, point it at your target, and you're good to go. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty dangerous situation there. Um, headers, CSP, secure headers. Just What I would say is just go check out secure headers. Um, it's a gem written by one of the guys, Neil, at uh, Twitter. Uh, it's got some X frame options. It's got CSP stuff in there. So if you're not familiar with CSP, the idea is that as a bra browser standard, we can prevent cross site scripting. But go ahead and just you know take a look at it. I would I'd really recommend it. Okay, so logic layer. All right, number one rule really. Actually, this is the number one rule uh, you know ever is don't trust users. Period. Um, when we talk about insecure direct object reference, so we'll take that cross-site scripting vulnerability and you know show it in in uh, in, in form. So basically, um, let's say that I uh, yeah I'll just keep the first name is uh, just imagine this JavaScript is uh, pointing them at beef. So then what I'll do is I'll show you actually.
All right. So we go to submit this, uh, submit this to the application. Um, and there's an interesting parameter right there, which is user ID. So, you know, I'll just go ahead and change that to, to one. Um, and also change the email address so that it's an actual person or sort of. Uh, doing a couple things here. For one, I'm cross-site scripting the admin of this because the application does not validate by current user and instead takes the parameter that you've just pro provided it and uh, actually updates based off that. Um, we kind of showed that. So uh, yeah, it's the uh, param. Actually, this is SQL injectable too, by the way. Um, but we take the user input, we find the user by their ID that they've provided us. So obviously, if I rotate that, that's, that's a no-brainer. So I'm going to do two things here. One, I'm actually going to override the uh, email address of the admin. And then the next, they also, I'm going to cross-site scripting. I'm going to cross-site script the admin, just so I can show two concepts sort of at once. Um, so I'll go ahead and log out of the application. Let's make sure mail catcher's up and running. Good to go. I go ahead and do a forgot password reset for that admin's email. Alrighty, we'll reset the admin. We already changed their uh, their um, email address, so we'll just change their password as well. Cool. So we, uh, yeah, obviously if we visit our account, uh, account settings, we, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, we, we implement HTML safe. So the cross-site scripting is not executing right now. But the point is, uh, that's what I was saying with, you know, don't think that just in, in, in terms of, hey, can I just attack myself? Always think of other vulnerabilities that when chained together can cause a, a chain reaction. So yeah, here we are as the, uh, as the admin. So insecure direct object reference is a direct result of taking user input and allowing it to manipulate some access control decision. That's essentially really what it boils down to. Uh, remote code execution, the only thing I really want to touch on here is uh, yaml.load and marshall.load. Um, don't allow dynamic or user supplied input to ever go into those type of calls because again, that leads to them having a shell on the web server running your Rails application, the attacker. Uh, be careful with your Regular expression. I think this is an important one that we talked about earlier. Instead of having you all do a spot the bug exercise, I'll walk you through the, the vulnerability. <coughs> all right, so we have two before filters. When I created this, uh, what had happened was I was reviewing an application and um, Half of this logic was in a gem, and half of the other logic was in the application. So um, the way it works is we have two filters here. We have valid API token, and that just validates that the API token provided the application is valid. And the second one is extrapolate a user uh, from, that, from that value. Um, again, the before filter, two different before filters. One was in a gem, one was in the application. Here, to make it concise, it's all in one file. So what we're really doing here is we're taking this uh, token provided by the user. We're using the, uh, um, what is it, the authenticate or request with HTTP token method built in. And we're calling identify token user, right? So what we do here is we unescape, which is just CGI uh, unescape. Um, and then we clean the token. So what we're doing here is we're taking two parts of that token and uh, splitting it in half, essentially. And what we're going to do with that is call check hash which performs a SHA-1 ha uh, hash of it using a server-side salt known only to the server-side, along with an ID, which is the you know, value, the first value extracted from that token. And then uh, if the hash provided the, by the user, uh, which is the second part of this token, and I'm going to show all this, if that matches up with what we just did here in this hashing algorithm, you're good. Continue on to the next, uh, next bit there. So, and then we'll extrapolate in the next before filter the user, and that's down here. We do a user dot find by ID, um, but we've made sure that the token's valid. So in theory, it shouldn't matter, right? Because we, it's a lot like what we do with our client side cookies. So, that being said, um, let me format a request here.
All right. All right. So tried to make this big enough. Hopefully everyone can see this. It's kind of, it is hard to see. Um, what happens is we have this token. It's for user ID two. So it says two dash and has some long hash. So we're making this request to API version one users. And what we get back is, well, I mean, just so, just so there's some awareness here, as JSON uh, in and of itself returns an entire model object. So if you're ever using as JSON and not saying, hey, these are the only things I want to send back, they're going to get everything. And in this case, like this isn't a vulnerability, but it is a vulnerability. The, the password is return the hash, um, sort of like their role and um, auth token, which is for their cookie, right? So, um, but it's just for the one user. So the idea is, is that, and the important part, the first vulnerability that kind of popped up here, we'll go to Rubular, and we'll input this regex. Uh, maybe too big. All right, so one dash hash is what I'll say, right? Just some match group that I can match all this again. So you see that there's that first value, which is your user ID, and then there's that second part, which is the hash that gets extrapolated from this regex. Um, anybody have an idea why that's a problem at all? Uh, besides, again, I just let me just put this caveat out once. Anybody that was in the class earlier, no, no answers there. Please. Anybody? Maybe I blow it up. Make it bigger. Well, because the, the hash has to match up with the user ID, in theory, that wouldn't work. Okay. The regex is broken. And the reason it's, it's, or it's not, I shouldn't say broken. That'll work kind of just fine. But the problem is, is that there's nothing saying, hey, don't put anything else in there. So what we, what's the preferred method in Rails is to make sure that you, and this is, or so not Rails, but Ruby specifically, and this really is a Ruby specific nuance. Uh, you want to have some anchors around regex like this. The reason is, is without those regex bits there, um, let's say, you know, Two is my user ID, hash is my token. Uh, basically, at that point, um, we put in a new line, right? And it still works. It's still the correct user identifier. It's still the correct hash. But then we get to extrapolate user down here. And at this point, we're calling a split on those values. So we're calling a split. And that's going to return this two and the one. So one new line two. So in, in practice, what I'm saying is that it looks something like this. 1%0A. And that's uh, percent zero a is your all encoded uh, version of new line. And when we do that, you'll see we get all of the user's uh, information back because we're an admin. So to show you uh, another little nuance of this vulnerability, and I, like to, I always like to show this one because it's like probably one of the most interesting ones I've seen yet. So uh, Rails or Ruby, sorry. What does it do with uh, something like this when you call 2i? It takes the one, right? So if I'm doing user.find, so I'm calling dot, I called dot 2i for if anybody can't see. Uh, so if I do something like this, what's happening is dot find is taking, because uh, the column type is an integer, it's going, to, it's going to go ahead and say, okay, you provided me a string, but I know the column's an integer, I'm going to do some normalization, I'm going to call it to integer, I'm going to convert this. And what it does is you'll see that uh, basically the one is taken, but the two is totally ignored. So that was actually how we sort of bypassed that um, simply by new line. And, and by the way, let me show you that one more time in Rubular. Again, if I actually put those anchors in, you'll notice there's no matches, right? So it's a good way. I mean, this is a good way to, uh, to make sure that your regex um, behaves the way that you want. And isn't there, like, because uh, I, I used to always use caret and dollar, but the, this is, like, recommended over that, right? So what's the... Yeah, caret and dollar don't deal with those new line characters. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's just a nuance of Ruby. And... Uh, Still see there, a lot of like. There are equivalents. There are equivalents in other form in PCRE. There's an equivalent thing. It's capital A and little a C. I think for like Perl regular expressions. 
So it's a problem in other systems, but this is the what you showed was the Ruby we syntax. Actually, yeah, we'd actually tried it in Perl and uh, um, actually, even using a caret and dollar sign didn't work. Like we didn't even need it. Yeah, we didn't even need the A and Z anchors. I'm not sure why, but we just thought, hey, let's give it a shot, and it didn't work. So I don't know. Uh, didn't go much farther though. Um, let's see here. So I think the the I'm going to briefly go through this. I want to talk a little bit about Rails Go, where we're going, and uh, then have give you your night pack. All right, so uh, C surf cross site uh, request forgery. If you're not familiar, what this means is that you know the behavior of the browser is that if a cookie is set for atlrug.com, it's going to be sent when you request atl dot or atlrug.com. That's the nature of the browser. And because of that same origin policy, if there are no protections, no unique tokens that get verified when so if you send a request off to a site and there's no token verified. What that means is like I could visit any site, that site could give me a form and tell me to go ahead and shove that off to atlrug.com, submit something, and at that point, um, if there is no validation, it's just gonna happen without me knowing behind the scenes. So CSERF is built into Rails, it's a really good, uh, or cross-site request forgery. Um, it's a really good feature within Rails, but there are a few things to, to a couple things to be aware of. So one uh, is that the Match, uh, Rails 4 actually complains if you try to use match routes, and there's a good reason. If you use match routes in 2 and 3, basically that means a route can e be either be get and post. And CSERF protection is only enabled on those routes which uh, require post methods. So if you're using match and you're not, that was just like an easy way to write the route versus, you know, you could have said just post, uh, yeah, I would revert that and change that because if somebody just flips that, like, you know, this tool, for instance, it just allows me to change the request method easily, right? So I could just take a post request, change it around, make it into a get request, email you a link, and you know maybe you'll transfer some funds or I don't know, whatever the application does. So yes, please make sure that you're right. uh, And then the other thing, so CSERF, the protect from forgery uh, filter, it does not actually halt the chain of execution. This is actually something I recently learned. Um, so it doesn't say, hey, that CSERF token isn't valid. What it says is, or, and, and that you have to you know, basically stop executing code. What it says is, is that if that CSERF token is invalid, I'll reset your session. But if you have an action that doesn't have any before filter in front of it that requires something based off a session, like for instance, if you're using some custom token or a cookie, or maybe you're not using a before filter at all, if it's not a session generated by Rails, when a reset session gets called, that's fine. If you didn't need a session in the first place to get to that action, the code will still execute. So CSER protections at that point are they're, yeah, null and void. Um, Uh, just briefly, just want to mention login, logout, reset session, both on login and logout. Reason is, is you want to avoid session fixation vulnerabilities. Uh, that's a long one to explain, so I won't get into it right now. Redirect two. Uh, if you'd like to protect your, because uh, you know, cross-site scripting is one way to get somebody into a beef server. Redirect uh, two is another way. So if I'm providing user input to that re redirect two method and I'm not actually validating where that data is going, somebody could potentially point me back at a, uh, you know, a bad guy site. And um, the way I would pre uh, prevent this is to use URL dot, or URI.parse, sorry. And from that point, I mean, you can you know, basically do a, uh, so you can call things like you know, the path, the port, and the point is that you don't have to write your custom, your own custom regex to extrapolate, um, you know, these like the path, the host, the port, the protocol. You don't need to do that. URI dot parse does it for you, and so at that point, then you can say, hey, does this path match, or this whatever variables inside of that, you know, hey, does this match um, the intended list or the list of intended URLs I expect this person to to go off to? If not, reject it. So that's the prevention for that. All right. Um, any questions so far? It's been real quiet, so just curious if it's interesting or if you're, you know, 
if, if there are some things I'm just kind of glazing over and. When hackers try to use these vulnerabilities, do so they just kind of have a list of them, they systematically go through them, or have they try to identify their different clues of which ones to kind of ask to go down? You mean in terms of uh, like the type of framework you're attacking as in terms of identifying it or a methodology? Yeah, like what's what's the methodology? Like how do you, and, and then the, the other question is like how do you decide like what to prioritize as a developer, like what vulnerabilities? Yeah, I mean, so one way to prior, prioritize it is, you know, by risk, right? And that's, I think, how most people do it is, is like, what's the real risk of this vulnerability? Um, and then at that point, you know, it, you kind of prioritize it in terms of how you, however you're prioritizing your stories or however you're prioritizing your bug submissions. You say, well, the risk of something like cross-site scripting, SQL injection, mass assignment, uh, metaprogramming flaws like constantize and send, those are higher level issues, so I should correct those immediately. Uh, and then imme admittedly, some of the best practice type stuff, those get pushed to the back a little bit. So um, they shouldn't, uh, long term anyways, but I can understand uh, having higher priorities. Does that answer the question? Okay. Uh, I won't go through that actually. Um, what I do want to show you is the unit test that I talked about. Um, by the way, speaking of metaprogramming, uh, is anybody familiar with why constantize is vulnerable if you use it with user input? All right, just real quickly before I go on to the unit tests. So constantize is a uh, you know standard metaprogramming. Um, so you might see something like user dot classify, or sorry, some parameter. We'll say user. The string user is a parameter dot classify. Uh, dot constantize, or you might just see dot constantize. All classify does is just creates that string user, just like uppercase it to look like a class, nothing more. Um, however, constantize is a little bit more interesting. So what constantize does is it actually takes that string value and converts it into code. Um, so if you were to do something like taking the user input here, and the user entered logger, and you took, you know, did a dot new, and took user input there. You can see that we uh, actually have shell level access um, to this system, essentially using the constantized method. Again, it all comes down to about, comes down to how much of the user input you're actually trusting. But that's a danger of constantized. So I, I urge you to go back and look at how you're using it if you are using it. Like they should put it in RAMs with certain constants can be constantized. Yeah, I agree. There should be some protection. I mean, Rails does a good job. Is that Ruby tool or uh, constantized? Is that Rails? Rails is it Rails specifically? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I used it the other day, but yeah. you know, but but I I know enough that this isn't something I expose to user input. So. Yeah. Some people use it uh, just to so they don't have to repeat themselves, yeah. so they can have multiple. Pieces that I mean, sometimes you're truly doing dynamic programming, you know, and so. Yeah, yeah, it's just tricky when you use, you know, if you're it's, directly. It's where you expose that again. The, yeah, exactly. user input, It's where you expose it that makes the difference. That makes all the difference in the world. How you expose it. Uh, so the unit test, real quick. Uh, and there's a bunch of meta programs. Actually, that's one thing I am going to be putting into Rails Go is all the lists of the things that I found that are the most common and dangerous meta programming techniques. Uh, but anyway, so rake training, um, or you can just run rake. And uh, what this does is we have, like I said, about 21 different, uh, that's not right. So we have about 21 unit tests all centered around actually exploiting some of the security bones from like the easy stuff, the best practice stuff to the more serious stuff. And uh, as you fix it, uh, it'll go green. Uh, some of this has been fixed since I've been going through this code base today. Um, and as, like I said, as you fix it, um, and inside, I should point out also that inside Rails Go, for every uh, vulnerability, there's also commented out fix, fixes for it. Because the idea is that um, this is not meant to be something that's just like, hey, you know, I just want to hack. I mean, 
obviously you can you can hack on this. You can learn uh, how to beat up on a Rails application. But what you'll notice in all of these tutorials is that we always give um, both the attack solution as well as the uh, defense solution, like how to actually fix the code issues. Uh, I feel that it's very important. And then again, inside the code base, it's always commented out. Like here's the vulnerable method, here's the secure method commented out, or more secure method. Um, so yeah. Uh, like I said, all these tutorials, they kind of follow the OWASP top 10. This is an OWASP project. I should mention that. Um, if you're not familiar with o OWASP, it's the Open Web Application Security Project. Uh, it's a bunch of folks globally, huge community um, that is dedicated to security of uh, web applications. Um, beyond the OWASP top 10, the normal things, there are some special things in there. Like uh, we show actually using um, both Breakman and Bundler Audit, implementing it with something like Guard to protect you at the earliest stage of development while you're developing. Uh, we show like metaprogramming and logic flaws. We've got a couple logic flaws in there. Um, all of this needs to be extended. It needs to be improved upon. It's just a matter of the amount of people interested, who's contributing, how much time people have, obviously. So uh, what I would urge is unit tests can be used to detect like simple things like, hey, am I really making sure that my password complexity rules work the way I, I think they should work? Um, but then there's this whole other thing that you should be looking for, and that's if you've identified a vulnerability in your application, write a unit test for it. And if that unit test fails, it could be just because the unit test itself hasn't caught up with the new code, or it could be that that vulnerability regressed back into your code base you know, like I've said a million times with Git, it happens all the time, rebasing, branching, pull request, all of that, like that really happens way too often. And this is one way you can detect uh, this stuff coming back in, just like any of uh, the functional stuff that you would test for. Uh, defensive tools. So all of these are free. Um, in Snare and Rack Attack, we're working on putting into Rails Go. In Snare is a honeypot, but the nice thing about in Snare is that not only are you detecting that somebody's attacking you, but you actually kind of attack them back. You get a little bit offensive, so you actually start slowing down uh, attackers. You start kind of messing with them, resetting. I mean, there's a whole bunch of cool things you can do. So we're trying to, it's a fairly new gem, so we're really trying to work with uh, improving the gem because it's kind of hard to get implemented right now as well as put it into Rails Go. And Rack Attack is just an anti-automation gem. Really, it sits at the middleware level and makes sure that if you've got an API, people can't just sit there all day long. And it uses a few different uh, variables, IP and some headers, to just basically make sure that uh, the same user isn't constantly trying to automate an attack. So Breakman and Bundler Audit. These are the two that if you don't use these, I, I just, you, ha you, you should really use these. I implore you to use these. They're free. They're both gems. And Breakman is really cool. You'd normally have to pay a lot of money for this. Um, Justin Collins uh, works alongside Neil. I talked about Neil doing CSP at Twitter. Justin Collins' full-time job is to improve this tool, mostly. Um, so what it does is it's a free static analysis tool specifically for Rails. It doesn't do Sinatra. It doesn't do anything else. It just does Rails. Handles all versions of Rails as well. So we'll run this uh, Breakman tool on our web application. We'll output it, we'll output it to a uh, HTML report. And within seconds, you kind of have all of the high list. Like, so here's, uh, you know, this is um, actually, if you can see it, this is actually a place where we call the dot classifies dot constatize type deal. Um, so it actually shows the vulnerable code snippets within the uh, classification, the warning type. You have all of this, you know, like we've got a dangerous send method, we've got some file access. All of that's legit, by the way. This is a terrible application for the security. <laughs> <laughs> and you can click on that and get documentation on what that means. Yes. So if you click this, and I actually asked Justin just last weekend to make this so that you have the uh, target blank because if you click on this, it just takes you out of this page and takes you directly to his site. But he's got, uh, for each one of these, um, there are lengthy, uh, well, this one's not super lengthy, but there are descriptions on each one of the, each one of the vulnerabilities. Um, now, there are two things to keep in mind. One, you can integrate this, this with Guard, and we show that in Rails Go. The other place you can do this is put it up in Hudson or uh, Jenkins. And as you continuously deploy throughout the day, uh, have it just detect that change to master or whatever branch makes sense. Um, Breakman will run if there's a failure, if there's a high vulnerability. You can actually set it to say, like, if it's a high vulnerability, email me. Um, or if it's a medium or high, something like that. Uh, so I would say that's a really good defensive measure. 
Um, yeah, I would definitely say use this. Uh, and then, I, and just so you know, like who's using Code Climate? All right, I don't know if it's widely known, but Code Climate actually uses Brakeman as its engine. So all the static analysis is happening at Code, uh, Code Climate that you're paying for. And not that I, I think it's a great tool because the UI is awesome. It actually gives you all that false positive features. I, I like it a lot, actually. But I just want to be very clear that this is the same, uh, in terms of the actual engine that drives it, this is the same thing. So you're getting it for free. I would say use it. That's, that would be my. Uh, and then the other one is bundle audit. So uh, this is kind of a bad example because Al uh, up is helping us upgrade, or he's upgrading. And so a lot of the stuff that we had purposely put in there, those gems that were vulnerable and old and had a bunch of CVEs, they're no longer there. But um, so it says no unpatched versions. But typically, what it, you'd see a month ago is just red, 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 red. You know, remote like. Uh, file access or re remote code execution, uh, system execution, file access, all this, all this like terribleness that um, uh, it detected. And so I would say bundle audit's a great uh, tool as well because as you're uh, as you're including gems in your application, if it has a CVE, this will help you detect it. So, so the, is that just getting back to a database of, of known versions of, of gems that are have vulnerabilities? Exactly. And the, the, the one thing I, I don't, I'm not clear on is because for a while we were saying, well, you know, the DB that's in there, you have to actually upgrade the gem to upgrade the DB. But I think that he's done some sort of uh, sim link to another location uh, on a remote application. I think. I, I, yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, so in the meantime, while that's running, uh, roadmap. So um, please use the GitHub issue tracker if you like want to see some feature requests. Uh, we are trying to make this uh, a good tool. So if you want to, if if there's something you don't like or you do want, uh, you're the target audience. So please tell us what what's up. Um, looking for more contributors. Uh, so this is the question part. Uh, any questions from anyone? I have a question. Okay. So, so do you, so do you have a relationship with OWASP? And I mean, as far as being proactive as implementing, you know, the vulnerabilities like in Railscope when they become um, known, um, or is or is it just you know doing you know due diligence to to to, to monitor that stuff? Uh, so, yeah, basically, what it is is that. Um, so we, as a company, are we primary is we primarily review. Uh, we review a lot of Ruby on Rails applications. We review a lot of applications, mobile and web. But uh, what happens is, is, like, based off that background, both Mike and I have seen. I mean, I've seen a lot of Rails applications. You might have might have worked on an application I've seen. So basically, what we do is we take those lessons learned. And yes, this is an OWASP project. Um, they they sponsor it in the way that um, you know they. Uh, market it and all that. Uh, but yeah, it's really just a combination of things we've seen um, and some of the things that people are like, hey, did you see this new vulnerability? And it's just a lot of us just keeping up to date based off of things we've seen. And yeah, yeah. yeah. So does that answer that question? All right, cool. Nothing else? Uh, so I updated it, still, still says it's clean, so. Um, all right, so. Here's another thing. Uh, basically, we have. Uh, I'm going to give these free subscriptions for uh, one year subscription is 100 bucks. I'm going to give it to everybody for free. But what I need, if, and and by the way, this is a screencast uh, site. It shows you both builder and breaker tips. So if you're a breaker, it shows you how to hack into applications. If you're a builder, it shows you how to secure your applications. So we have a new video on uh, secure coding guidelines for Swift being released on Friday. So if you send an email to contact at setcast.com and you put in the subject line, anything related to the fact you're at ATL Rug and that you want a free subscription, um, around the time that we're releasing that Swift video, we'll also be setting it with a free subscription. So again, it's a $100 value. I would say, yeah, I would say go for it. If you're interested. If you showed this one of those videos. Yeah, actually, one of the videos. Yeah, that's a good point. One of the videos I showed you uh, with the XSS and me holding a blackboard. That was a snippet of one of the the videos. So, um, 
yeah, so if you send it, we'll get you set up. And uh, I'm going to move past this. And if you, have, uh, if you need this information afterwards, let me know. All right, so uh, I'm at CK Tricky on Twitter. Uh, Mike McCabe is MC, it's McCabe615. Um, those are our email addresses. If you ever want to ping us for questions or you're like, hey, I want to do something with Rails Go, where should I start? Uh, those are good email addresses to get us at Ken at Mizium, Mike at Mizium.com. And then the last link here is actually for Rails Go. So it's, uh, if you Google Rails Go, you can't miss it. But you know, for those who, I don't know, don't want to use Google, uh, railsgoat.cktricky.com. Uh, then these are the people that I, I think we should thank. So first of all, Al, thank you for hooking this all up. That workshop was, I think, a lot of fun. Uh, speaking to all of you, this was fun. Um, and Al really played a pivotal part in that. Uh, Jim Manico, he's with OWASP. He got this project off the ground. Jack Menino for uh, letting me, uh, he's the CEO of our uh, company, and he let me uh, come out here and do this. Uh, Justin Collins and Neil from Twitter, because they're awesome and build great security tools for, from a defensive perspective, and they help all of us, and they really need to be recognized. Uh, and then there's just a bunch of other folks. I think Chris Morris from Living Social, a whole bunch of other folks who have uh, contributed. So um, all in all, I want to say thank you to all of you. I hope you learned something. Please go back and review your code. If you want uh, more information, um, go through the Rails Go tutorial. There's a lot of good stuff in there, and I think all of it's use useful. So thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.